Welcome back. I'm Owen Vallis, Professor of Music Technology at California Institute of the Arts. We're going to continue looking at the Monarch blocks in the new Reactor 6. We've been looking at the oscillators, and we saw how clicking on the top here allows you to choose between the three different types available. We also took a look at how to turn on keyboard tracking, as well as set the octaves, and the type of waveform for each oscillator. This is routed here into our mixer section, which then gets passed on to the filter. The filter here has a few different selections. We can have our four pole sort of mini Moog emulation, Monarch emulation setting here. We can also do a less aggressive two pole low pass, even less aggressive one pole, and finally a band pass. Let's hear what each of those sounds like. So I'm gonna play a note here. That's the most aggressive setting. And by aggressive, I mean that anything above where that cutoff knob is set is being attenuated very aggressively. In fact, it's being attenuated at 24 decibels per octave. Setting it to something like LP2 or low pass 2 means that we're attenuating at half that rate or 12 decibels per octave. You can kind of hear how some of the highs are preserved. Again, the resonance at the moment is quite high, which is what we're hearing is that very pronounced sweep, but it makes it easy to hear where the cutoff is. Let's go to low pass 1 here. This will be the least aggressive at only 6 decibels per octave. For comparison, I'll jump right back up to the 4 pole, and now all the way back down to the 1 pole. Lastly, we have a band pass which cuts off everything on either side of what our cutoff is. Additionally, not only are the, the regular cutoff and resonance knobs available like you would find on most filters, but we also have a way for applying feedback and load. Load is how hard we're driving the signal into the filter, where feedback is how much of the signal is being allowed to come back into the input or feedback on itself. Using these, we can create some very distorted and kind of squelchy sounds. So let's hear how the feedback sounds as we turn that up. I'm going to start from all the way down and move the cutoff up and down so we can get a good sense of what the timbre of the sound currently is. Now increasing the feedback, we'll hear how it becomes very crunchy and distorted. Again, this is a very powerful tool for whether you want your sound to be clean or to have a lot of grit. Let's turn feedback down a little bit, and let's talk about keyboard tracking. Keyboard tracking is, as I play the keyboard, the cutoff should track with me. The idea being that if I had a static cutoff, but I had a sound with a lot of harmonics, as I played higher up on the keyboard, the cutoff would remove more and more of the harmonics from the sound, essentially changing the timbre. So even though the timbre of a piano changes as you do play higher notes, the quality of it pretty much stays the same. So what we would like is for the cutoff knob to move with us as we move further up the keyboard. We can enable this by turning on keyboard tracking. Essentially, all the way to the left means there is no keyboard tracking. And as I play up the keyboard, increasing amounts of filtering will be applied. As I turn on the keyboard tracking, the cutoff filter should move up the keyboard with me. We can see how the sound stays brighter for longer, and essentially retains a similar timbral characteristic or quality to it anywhere on the keyboard. The reason there's two sliders has to do with how the original Mini Moog was set up. You can have no keyboard tracking, one-third, two-thirds, or full keyboard tracking. Lastly, we have the ability to modulate any of these parameters, including an FM input. 
which the FM input essentially modulates the cutoff frequency. Next, let's take a look at the envelopes. The envelopes have two different modes, A and F. These have to do with how the decay times or the curves apply to each of these stages. And the F stands for the filter curve. You could use it to drive your filter cutoff modulation input. And the A would be your amplitude input. So you could use this one to drive our volume control. So you can see here I've set this one to filter and it drives this and this one amplitude and it drives our volume knob. You'll notice also that we only have an attack decay and sustain, but there is a switch for release. Again, this is for historical reasons. The release setting was tied to the decay setting. So this means we really only set one knob for both the decay and the release, and they have the same time. Lastly, I want to go over these LFOs, which are our dedicated modulation sources. Up here in the top left, I have the ability to either make the LFO bipolar or unipolar, meaning that if it's bipolar, I get plus 0.5 and minus 0.5, whereas if it's positive, then I get 0 to 1. So again, you can kind of see how with the positive, we only get the one color. This would be the unipolar setting, and then the bipolar is represented by the two colors, with the blue representing the inverted signal. This is probably a good time to bring up that with blocks, again, NI's efforts to simplify building synths means that all signals are within a 0 to 1 range. Now, that range might be slightly shifted, as in the case with the bipolar LFO, where it goes between plus 0.5 and negative 0.5. But this makes it easy for any block to accept any input. This also includes pitch. So pitch comes in as a 0 to 1 as well. We can change the shape of our square wave here, or we can go over to the oscillator itself and select different LFO shapes. The blinking indicator here shows us roughly the in and out of the phase of our LFO and can give us a rough indication of how fast it's oscillating. Up here we have the ability to reset it manually, but we can also reset it using other modulation sources or pause it temporarily. We could assign these controls to buttons on our keyboard over here and use it to perform live. Lastly, this LFO goes into our control voltage processor. And this control voltage processor is a way to manipulate and shape our modulators. We get a way to turn up and down the volume. We can apply a curve. Again, because everything is pretty much between 0 and 1, these curves will just bend the information. I can apply an offset to push the modulation source around. I can also clip it. So again, here, this would make all negative values 0. This would make all values positive. This would make all positive values 0. And this one would make all values negative. So in this way, we can sort of rectify, flip, transform, and reshape all of our modulation sources. The last one I want to talk about is SLU. The easiest way to think about SLU is that it's a filter, but for our control signals. Essentially, if our filter's jumping around really quickly, SLU will slow it down and make the time between transitions smoother. This can be useful if we have a random, say, LFO like this, where it's just stepping around values. We can apply some SLU and create more of a drunken walk so that each new random value just smoothly interpolates to the next. Lastly, let's take a look at the delay and the scope. The delay here looks pretty much like our reverb, which is nice, because this makes it very easy to use. We have the high pass, low pass, and feedback. But up here, we also have how we want to process the sound. With grain enabled, essentially, we won't hear any drastic shifts in pitch. So as I change the time, the pitch should stay pretty constant. If I disable the grain control though, now when I change the time, we're going to hear changes in pitch in the delay. In 
fact, we use that to effect by applying a modulation input source to our delay time. So let's increase our feedback here, turn up the mix, make sure the grain is disabled. We could turn on Pong, which is a more stereo style delay effect, but let's hear how this modulation source affects the sound or pitch quality of our output. So that shifting in sound is this random LFO being sent over here and modulating our time. If I pull the slew back a little bit, we'll hear how the steps become more pronounced. Again, increasing the slew smooths out that control source. Lastly, let's take a look at the scope. The scope is not only a good way to see your waveform, but can also be used to check the output of other blocks, like let's say we take a look at the envelope. Jumping inside, we would want to disconnect the pitch, and instead of hooking it up to our oscillator, we're going to tell it to listen instead to the envelope. Over here, we're just going to tell it to be free running, and we need to increase the headroom a little bit and make it unipolar because our envelope only goes between 0 and 1. We can now see the shape of the envelope. Changing this multiplier changes the time scale, which allows us to see more of the envelope. You can see as I change the decay time, the envelope gets shorter. And we can also see how it re-triggers. This can be very useful for getting a feel about how these different modulators work. So we've reviewed a bunch of different modules, seen some new ones and heard what they sound like, as well as learned a few different ways to morph and control our different modulation sources. In the next video, we're going to take a look at how to put all of these pieces together and begin to use them with a sequencer. If you want to learn more about Reactor, join us at cadenze.com, where we go over how to build your synths from scratch using Reactor and Primary.